is uh, Dan Pendergast from Collins Aerospace. And first of all, I'd like to thank the World ATM Congress 2020 for allowing this opportunity for us to have a meaningful conversation on aviation communications today. Um, a couple of administrative items that I'd like to repeat. Um, you should all be on mute. Um, and please uh, stay that way throughout the course of the presentation. It will ensure that the audio quality remains and you can hear what we're talking about. Um, secondly, um, we are going to handle questions through the chat uh, function of this webinar. And that can be found uh, if you hover over your screen. I think it's on the bottom of your screen. There's a little circle that, um, you know, that uh, is there and it will bring up a chat box. You can type questions in at any time and we'll try to answer as many of them as, as we can um, at the end of the presentation and get back to you um, if we don't have time or um, don't have answers for you. Um, and then finally, uh, we apologize for the multiple reminders that you might have received um, and, uh, and any, any problems that might have occurred, but uh, I guess we just wanted to make sure that you, you were here um, and uh, joined us. So anyway, so we have a presentation today that we, we're calling the Data Link Dilemma. And um, really, uh, why do we think this is important? Well, um, w I would say that most, if not all of us, are stakeholders in uh, commercial aviation data link communication. And we rely on, on this system uh, to perform the functions uh, that we, we need it to, to communicate uh, to, to aircraft and to various entities uh, on the ground. And we expect it to uh, to operate well. And um, you know, this system has uh, been around for many years. It's very reliable, and it's been very uh, available. And um, there's been um, quite an evolution that's been occurring over over the past couple of years that has uh, has caused some really uh, significant changes, which are all good in terms of the technologies and and. Uh, and um, the capabilities that are out there. And um, many of us are sitting here wrestling with, well, um, how, how are the systems that we're using today, how are they going to evolve and adapt as time goes forward? And um, what's the plan? Um, you know, how should we prepare for change as it occurs? And how long are these systems going to last? And um, are they going to evolve? So uh, what we've prepared today is um, a, a presentation that will bring you through some background and context of, um, of where we are today and, and some, you know, some trends and some assumptions um, about um, how, how things have been um, um, performing and operating over, over, the, over, the, over the past few decades. And then we're going to get into some technologies that are that are out there um, that can help us move forward um, in the near, medium, and long term. I mean, not only to keep today's technology performing in the manner that we, we would like it to and expect it, but also to prepare us for the future when, um, when communications change. Um, one thing uh, to, to keep in mind is that uh, technology doesn't change overnight, especially as you all know in aviation, where we are we live with what we have for many years before the change occurs. And um, what we need to do as all stakeholders is to preserve the capabilities so that um, when the change does occur, um, that, the, that it occurs in a smooth, as smooth manner as possible for the users. So to begin, what I'd like to do is, is talk about this evolution. Um, what we're experiencing today uh, in terms of technology and how it's evolving is began, um, for as far as data link is concerned, um, over 40 years ago. Um, ACARS uh, began before, in 1978, VHF ACARS, been around uh, for, for many, many years. It's there today. It's evolved over time, um, became uh, much more capable. It's being used prolifically uh, by many uh, airlines, ANSPs, throughout the world uh, to do many things and provide many benefits. And these, these capabilities that ACARS are providing 
um, will continue for quite a long time. In fact, the aircraft that are being built today uh, that are going off the production line and, and those that are in the, um, you know, on the, on the planning board will still have ACARS and in many cases the VHF system which is uh, prevalent today uh, as the as the main uh, medium to deliver uh, ACARS messages. So, you know, going going through this evolution, um, ACARS began, but because it, um, of its performance and its increased use and acceptance in the 1990s, uh, the first step to expand its use was FANS. And FANS is the first, uh, the first use of data link uh, to use for, C for controller pilot data link communication, CPDLC, primarily over the, uh, the Atlantic using a satellite system. But this was an important evolution of, of data link, which took the fundamentals of ACARS and now provided added benefits for air traffic control, for airplanes to communicate over data link over areas that um, voice uh, was uh, was not entirely optimal uh, in, in, a, in a manner that added uh, safety and efficiency to um, the airspace. And um, as fans evolved, uh, in the meantime, um, in Europe, uh, back in the late 1990s and in 2000, there was an initiative called PEDAL, Preliminary Euro Control Trial of Air Ground Data Link. And that was the first initiative to use data link over the terrestrial, over the terrestrial uh, la landscape to communicate to air traffic control. So it was a trial to prove out fans type of capabilities over, over land. But uh, we as stakeholders, we knew that we needed an improved version of, of data link to do that, and that was the emergence of VDL Mode 2. So VDL Mode 2 emerged about 20 years ago. And the primary purpose for VDL Mode 2 at the time was for CPDLC over the land using a protocol called ATN. Interestingly, uh, VDL Mode 2 was also adapted in the, uh, in the 2000s to provide a faster, higher bandwidth ACARS transmission capability. And why did that, why was that so important? Because back in the, in the early 2000s, um, ACARS started experiencing um, congestion problems where the growth in ACARS uh, was, growing, was growing so fast that we needed additional bandwidth on, on ACARS frequencies. And we saw the benefits of the VDL mode two frequencies as having more capacity and a higher throughput and adapted VDL mode two as a, a way to communicate ACARS or what we call AOC, airline operational control messages. And that's an important point to remember as we step through this because the volume of ACARS has grown over time. And what happened with VDL mode two 20 years ago um, is still a need today as we move forward. Um, now, VDL Mode 2 was, was proven out as a uh, air traffic control, uh, air traffic control CPDLC function. Uh, first, first of all, with the FAA Build 1, um, that was first, um, first experienced in the Miami Air Traffic Control Center area. Uh, it was a trial, uh, an initiative by the FAA to use VDL Mode 2 to prove out CPDLC in the US airspace. Uh, there were some, uh, some issues at the time in terms of coordinating it to expand it throughout the country. But meanwhile, in Europe, uh, the Link 2000 program um, um, took off. It took off uh, led by Eurocontrol and all the ANSPs. And in the early 2000, en route CPDLC started being uh, used and improved. And over the years, um, it's been deployed uh, throughout entire, the entire uh, Central Europe and expanding beyond Central Europe, where it's used today as a means to provide uh, controller pilot data link communication over data link throughout Europe um, and um, has been mandated for use um, as recently as, as early this year.
And at the same time, uh, the U.S. picked up uh, CPDLC and using VDL Mo2, uh, another form of VDL Mo2, mostly like fans over VDL Mo2, over en route, uh, over the en route U.S. So, why is this important? Well, this is important. It shows that you know we began a journey over over 40 years ago with data link, and this journey has evolved over time, and our VHF network, especially has grown in capabilities and has become more and more uh, capable, has become more and more um, um, valuable to not only airlines, but um, air traffic control authorities over time. So we as stakeholders, we are, we are um, in, in many ways obligated to be stewards of that and to um, protect it and to evolve it until the next generations of technologies are ready to, to take over. So we're going to focus on VHF primarily and what's going on with VHF and how do we see our, um, and I see this, uh, Abdullah, could you please uh, mute? Thank you. Um, and, and how we as stewards of, uh, of, of data link uh, from airlines and air traffic control can kind of help with that evolution. So where are we today? Um, as, I, as I discussed earlier, uh, our VHF networks are deployed around the world. Uh, there are multiple DSPs, not only Collins, but there are multiple DSPs, multiple, um, multiple ANSPs, FAA using VHF and VDL networks, and many, many airlines relying on it. And, and this is happening, uh, this capability is embedded in, in how we communicate to aircraft. And one very important thing to, to keep in mind is that the primary purpose of this network is for safety critical and operationally critical information. And uh, this is really key to understanding. We're talking about information that airlines need to dispatch and operate the aircraft or information that air traffic control needs to safely communicate to aircraft over data link. And the really the special and important thing about this is that we have private networks that are protected. In other words, this RF spectrum is protected and it's reserved for this use. And this is a very important attribute uh, that, um, that helps us uh, in terms of maintaining this capability. As I had mentioned also, is that, um, you know, the most recent evolution has been uh, the ANSPs in Europe and the FAA are now depending on uh, VDL uh, to launch en route CPDLC. So its importance has grown. And because of that, uh, Collins Aerospace, um, not only from the network side, but also the aircraft systems, we will continue to invest in VHF and in VDL, and we will continue to invest in ATN. And we foresee its use by not only the airlines, but ANSPs for many years to come, for decades. So we will continue to invest and make sure that it operates to meet the needs of our users as, as time moves on and as technology changes and as we prepare for the next systems that will eventually, um, eventually over time, uh, replace VHF. And um, we've seen a, uh, a, a tremendous growth in air travel um, over, over, the, over the past years. And despite the current challenge that we have, we see this continuing over, over time. Um, uh, air travel will continue to grow. Um, aircraft will, um, will uh, production will increase. And there will be, be especially a need for a narrow bodies. And these new aircraft are, as we all know, are very sophisticated. And they generate a tremendous amount of data, especially from aircraft systems and engine data. And that's been a significant, uh, that's been a significant um, uh, revelation as newer, as newer versions of aircraft have come out. And, um, and, and really, we're seeing um, especially from narrow body aircraft, um, uh, the A320neo and the, and the 737 MAX, that um, uh, ACARS is being used, uh, VHF ACARS being used to send the information. And why? Well, 
there really is not another link on the airplane that's been set up to send all this data. So VHF data um, is growing. And, and the reason why it's growing is engine and aircraft data. So when we talk about volumes of, uh, of, of ACARS information growing, we're really talking about aircraft and engine data. And I'm gonna be have a few slides on that later on in the presentation to kind of show that in a little bit more detail. And this, this increase in volume uh, really presents a challenge to us because as I mentioned earlier, we are here, really the system is primarily and should be used for safety and operational critical information. And it performs well doing that. And it can perform, um, it can perform well for the foreseeable future. But as the ACARS volume has increased, now we have a challenge on VHF capacity. Well, uh, the good news is, and we're gonna talk about this later in the presentation, is that we as stakeholders have options to mitigate the, this, these effects. So um, today, um, as I had mentioned, uh, especially with CPDOC, it is absolutely expected that the data link networks meet or exceed performance requirements. There are availability, reliability, message latency, message assurance requirements that have to be met. The data link, the data link systems for CPDLC must perform. You have to be you have to be assured that when a pilot or an air traffic controller sends a message that it is received. If not, uh, then that you have an unsafe operation. So we, um, as stakeholders, uh, realize that we maintain our networks that way and we invest that way. Um, and, and then you know when you look at ACARS as a protocol, and it is a protocol. I mean, many people get uh, confused that ACARS is VHF. Well, it's a, it's, a, it's a way to send information. It's what we call as media independent. So you can send it over satellite. You can send ACARS over narrow band satellite, broadband satellite, cellular, of course, VHF, HF data link and Wi-Fi. So um, as time has moved on, um, we've, seen, we've seen different types of connectivity being used for ACARS and that's good because it provides flexibility to the users to keep sending information and provides options uh, for airlines and ANSPs to use, to use the data link. So in terms of growth, you know, we talked about um, engine data. Engine data has been the main source of growth. But um, when we take a look at AOC data, the message sets that airlines use for AOC has been pretty much relatively, um, has stayed the same. They're the same kind of messages. There's been some growth but um, the, the, the types of AOC messages needed for dispatch has been, you know, stayed pretty much the same. However, on the other side, uh, controller pilot data link communication, um, that, grow, that will grow as we add more messages uh, to, um, to um, or message sets to CPDLC to expand the capabilities to communicate to the aircraft for air traffic control, that's gonna grow. And we, need to, and we need to make sure that we can accommodate that growth. They're relatively small messages, but there are, uh, there's gonna be growing volumes of them. So now I wanna I want to change gears here and kind of give you some insight into a new generation aircraft. This is really important. Um, today, so what you have here is you have a pie chart, a series of four pie charts, starting on the left from 2019 and going to the right to about 2034. So we have 15 years modeled out here. And each pie chart um, shows um, a share of types of aircraft that aircraft have in their fleet. And we've called them legacy. Legacy meaning uh, pre-new uh, generation aircraft. So aircraft that are classic type aircraft, 767s, 777s, um, Next generation aircraft, now you're getting into 787s, A350s, uh, NEOs, MAXs, and uh, regional aircraft. And these are aircraft that are built by Embraer and Bombardier. So if you see today, if you look at an airline's fleet, and this is pre-COVID, um, over three, you know, about three quarters of their aircraft are legacy aircraft. So today, um, as we've seen volume increases, um, still three quarters of an airline's fleet are these legacy aircraft. 
And as you move forward to the right and to time, you know, 10 years uh, from 2019, you'll see as these legacy aircraft are retired and new generation aircraft are introduced into the fleet, now it becomes more of a 50-50 balance of new generation aircraft and legacy and regional. And then by the time you get out into 2034, now you see the shift changing where the majority of aircraft are our next generation aircraft. And this is really important because um, as time goes on, um, that percentage of next generation aircraft is only going to increase and data link volumes are going to increase. So over time, we as stakeholders have to do something about that to, uh, to protect the capabilities that we enjoy today. So um, breaking this down uh, a different way, we took a, um, uh, a newer generation narrow body aircraft and we took a look at um, the older and older and newer generation side by side and we broken up the pie chart by um, AOC or ATS data. So we're saying the safety and operational critical data and that's kind of highlighted in the green bluish uh, shade and then the aircraft and engine data is more in the orange, the orange color. And as you look between the older and the newer generation, you'll see two things. First of all, the volume of the data completely shifts from um, what was 25% volume uh, for older generation aircraft for engine data to almost 75%. And not only that, the amount of data that these aircraft send is four times the predecessor. So as we uh, as we start seeing the use uh, a cars growing, the volume of a cars growing, clearly again that growth is uh, is precipitated by and driven driven through engine and aircraft data. And um, so so how does that look over time? So what we've done um, is our models uh, we've we've taken a um, a projection based on those pie charts of, of what we see as aircraft deliveries from OEMs and aircraft retirements from airlines. And we've modeled it over time in terms of the amount of volume that these aircraft deliver, both engine and AOC. And we've seen uh, this growth, in other words, and here we've modeled just Europe. And um, we have a, a, this growth showing from 2019 to 2034 we see essentially from what we are, what the volume that we are experiencing today, if we just call that, you know, one, it's been three, it'll be three times the volume in 15 years from now. So we look at that and we say, you know, wow, what now? Uh, what can we do about that? Um, and the good news is, is that if we as, uh, as stakeholders, as, as a community uh, start to step out and work together to mitigate it, we can bring the slope of that line down by offloading uh, offloading information from VHF. And we can also do things to modernize VHF to uh, protect its capabilities, to extend its life for as long as it's needed. So uh, the remainder of the presentation, I'm gonna talk about three initiatives um, that would benefit us. And what we're talking about is benefiting a critical um, AOC and ATS information. So what, is we, what can we as stakeholders do as a communities do over the short, medium and long term? And I'm gonna talk about three, uh, th there's, there's several initiatives that are, that are ongoing right now, but I'm gonna talk about three that are on Collins's roadmap that we feel are, uh, are great initiatives to work together on. Uh, the first is, ACARS over IP. The second is a concept that we call advanced uh, VHF. And the third is the internet protocol suite. So I'm going to start off with ACARS over IP. Um, many of you have heard about ACARS over IP. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion about it in industry. And it's essentially, it's a very good thing. Um, ACARS over IP um, enables uh, aircraft that have broadband capability to send ACARS messages in the ACARS standard format, Airink 618, uh, 
um, from the aircraft to the ground. And uh, the way that we, that we have adopted it in Collins is we've, we've leveraged our global aviation network. So uh, we've, we have implemented ACARS over IP to be integrated into our network. So now that an aircraft with either broadband satellite or a cellular capability can, uh, can send and receive ACARS messages over IP. And this is fully integrated into our network. It's a global capability and um, it is capable of receiving and delivering ACARS messages over uh, IPSATCOM cellular, Wi-Fi, or any broadband link. And um, Airbus is, is implemented FOMAX capability. It has ACARS over IP. We're interoperable with that and also other aircraft interface devices. So um, ACARS over IP is a good thing. Um, one thing um, about it that, um, that, is, um, that we need to work on, though, is we need to kind of fine tune it to offload engine and aircraft information. And I'm ta I'll talk about that in a couple of slides. Uh, the early implementations, we believe, are not quite there yet. But let's just kind of keep that in mind. How can ACARS over IP offload engine and aircraft information while allowing safety critical information to be to remain on safety critical links. Well, right now would be our, the VHF networks that are worldwide or the safety critical um, um, satellite uh, networks that are offered by SATCOM service providers. So when we take a look at ACARS over IP, um, how does it, how is it implemented? How do we, how do we see it as working? So here we have an aircraft um, that aircraft has multiple ways of communicating. So if you, if you take a look at that, uh, the, the various options, you know, you have ACARS over traditional VHF, high frequency data link, and uh, L-band or safety traditional SATCOM. And what we've done is we've implemented ACARS over IP to take advantage of IP SATCOM. So that could be IP safety services like Swift Broadband Safety. That could be IP like a KA or KU uh, capability in the cabin, or that could be IP on the ground, like a cellular or Wi-Fi. And all of this is implemented into our network and our message processing systems and into our, into our ground network. So the aircraft seamlessly is able to communicate between IP links and narrowband links. And if the aircraft has the capability to choose between the IP and the, and the narrowband links and the safety services links to send different information, that that's an ideal state. So if, uh, if for instance, if we um, are flying and we have engine information, and engine information um, that is um, not safety critical, and say we're talking, uh, um, I would like to uh, keep engine exceedance information or any information that is an emergency on safety, on safety SATCOM, or safety VHF, how about offloading the other volumes of data on IP, then ACARS over IP, if the aircraft has the capability to judge between these types of messages, then that is the ideal, that is the ideal way to use ACARS over IP. So, so the, recommended, the recommendation is, hey, let's use ACARS over IP to offload engine and aircraft information that is not safety, that is not important to operational, that is not emergency related. And let's, hey, let's leverage the broadband link. And while we're en route, especially since engine information is, um, is sent over, over uh, while an aircraft is en route, how about cabin, how about cabin connectivity, ACARS over IP for engine and aircraft data. But at the same time, keep operational and safety information on VHF and VDL and safety service uh, and narrow body SATCOM to guarantee the availability and performance of that. Some examples include um, CPDLC, weight and balance, any other ACARS messages or engine information uh, that are either needed by the airline uh, to safely operate the aircraft. But one thing that we found is that in the ideal state, um, you know, the, optimally, hey, we can offload 75% of new generation aircraft on IP using ACARS over IP and keep the remaining 25% on VHF, VDL, and, um, and, and safety services SATCOM. So that's the exciting thing about ACARS over IP. And this is the way that we really see it benefiting industry. But the, the next topic I'm gonna talk about is advanced VHF. 
Um, advanced VHF is a concept at this point that Colin Zero Space is bringing to industry for industry to share and implement um, and uh, in a concept that we are very excited about uh, that we hope will be adopted by industry. So um, if you if you recall, uh, we've gone through various step fu uh, functions in modernizing our VHF networks. Uh, beginning, you know, well, 20 years ago, uh, we, we, we modernized with VDL. 20 years uh, has passed. Um, we believe it's time for a tech refresh of VHF. So how can we do this? Well, there is a, um, an opportunity and there is a way um, in a more cost-effective manner to take modest modifications to airborne radios on the aircraft and ground infrastructure, ground radios, in a backward manner, uh, manner a backward compatible uh, manner to uh, increase the data rate and increase the capacity of a VDL frequency. And um, as demonstrated in past, this is something that uh, Collins Aerospace believe has a lot of benefit, but it really, for it to be successful, it has to be accepted by industry. Um, and we have, to sh we have to jointly, all the stakeholders, um, have to kind of agree that it is worthwhile and it's something we want to do. So we want to take, fo take it forward um, in an industry standard approach. And this is something that we really want to focus on safety service performance. So it will, it will benefit airline operational control. It will benefit the ANSPs. And um, most importantly, it's business case driven. What we're talking about are modest modifications, change, uh, technical changes or performance changes, in, changes to the aircraft radios on the aircraft, leveraging the same systems that are on the aircraft, airplane, leveraging the ground networks that have been deployed, the, 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 the VHF and VDL net ground networks that have been deployed. So you don't need to, to implement a new system on the aircraft in the near term. You don't need to deploy a new global infrastructure. Costs are saved that way, and these, and especially uh, now and in the next few years, this is very important. You will be able to leverage the investment that you've already made in, v, in VDL and VHF. So if you're an a, NSP or your airline, you don't have to put a new communication systems on your airplane. You don't have to deploy a new network and hook it up to your to your end systems. And you also have the, the benefit of extending the life of your investment until new technologies um, take, take hold and have, have a critical mass. On uh, the concept, um, um, it's all about uh, what we call the waveform. The waveform in VDL is, um, is the uh, physics associated with uh, its capacity, how much, how much information you can put on a channel. And um, the, our, our engineers have looked into putting a new waveform within VDL mode two which kind of which, which uh, retains the same waveforms that VDL mode two has today and provides kind of a backward compatible manner. So advanced VD8, VHF and VDL can work together seamlessly. And while at the same time, we have a, uh, an increase in bandwidth and uh, throughput and also the capability, say for instance, if we have the need in some parts of the world, like Europe, uh, and maybe in some parts of the United States for advanced VHF, you don't have to deploy it throughout the world. You can deploy it in the regions that are, uh, that are needed first, and they can benefit from it. And then as time moves on, you can, you can deploy it in other parts of the world. And the aircraft, the way that it's implemented in the aircraft is that it can seamlessly, aircraft can seamlessly move between advanced VHF and, uh, and, and traditional uh, VDL as it flies around the airspace. So um, in summary, uh, we think this is a good thing. We think that um, that it's time to modernize advanced VHF and that if we get going uh, in industry, uh, we believe that we can have advanced VHF uh, out uh, and, uh, and deployed uh, in aircraft in the medium term. Um, I would say within the next five years, three to five years, much in uh, with which will give us time to um, 
uh, to uh, address capacity issues with other initiatives like ACARS over IP and extend the life of VHF until other new uh, technologies are available, um, such as the next one which I'm going to talk to you about, which is called the Internet Protocol Suite. So let's talk about the Internet Protocol Suite. Uh, the Internet Protocol Suite is an industry initiative that is um, that is underway um, today and has been for a while that is being worked on by um, all parts of industry, ICAO, OEMs, avionics manufacturers, service providers, and the um, the benefits of, uh, of IPS is um, we've been talking about IP, we've seen the value of IP communications, the protocol IP, um, and IP and using IP um, in our personal lives for many years. And there's a there's a, a need as we move forward in the future to take those benefits of IP and, and adopt them um, within aviation. And uh, while we do this, we really must pay attention to the unique needs of aviation with respect to, to IP communications because we know that aviation, uh, aviation needs are unique. So there are special considerations that are needed for IP communications, mostly security. How do we implement security uh, in aviation IP? How do we, how do we address aircraft mobility, the, the mobility of aircraft, aircraft flying around the world at high speeds? How do we deliver this protocol so that it, so that it can be implemented on multiple different types of, of communication um, uh, capabilities or communication data links? So um, this is an industry-driven initiative. It's on multiple stakeholders' roadmaps. It's on the ICAO roadmap. It's on the OEM roadmaps. It's on Collins Aerospace's roadmaps for avionics and for uh, data link communication services. And um, the benefits are, uh, when you take a look at the overview, um, the industry is looking to implement it so that it can be introduced in a mixed environment. So that as IP capabilities, uh, as the IP links are put on aircraft and IPS is deployed, uh, it will be able to operate um, with legacy aircraft and legacy ANSP end systems and airline end systems as new systems are brought on, on, on board. Um, it's, it, 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 is, it is agnostic of the different types of media. So it can be used over any uh, connectivity that has been deemed safety services. And this is important, it has to be safety service. So we're looking at you know, various satellite links, Aeromax, uh, VDO Mo2, uh, upcoming, upcoming high-speed VHF, upcoming high-speed HF offerings, or any other new connectivities that, are, uh, that, that may um, that may emerge over over the uh, near and medium and long term. It's very important that the communications it's encrypted, that there's authentic, uh, authentication, and uh, the service providers have to have to be certified and be trusted uh, to allow uh, that the aircraft can kind of uh, roam between different service providers. And keys are really important. So uh, again, a lot of emphasis. On, on security over the IP link. Uh, so one of the things that we've, uh, we've, we've been, uh, we're moving forward with that Collins is, is we're, we're gonna be doing some flight test, test demonstrations in the near future. The flight test demonstration will demonstrate a, uh, the, a, ver a version of IPS over IP SATCOM, safety service SATCOM, um, IP over VDL, over VDO ground stations. It'll be, it'll be connected to aircraft OEMs, the FAA and airlines uh, AOCs. It will show, um, it will demonstrate the security. Um, we will be operating fans over IPS and it will, um, it will uh, show kind of uh, prove out uh, the early phases of IPS. This is something I guess is something that's gonna require more work over the next few years. And the importance of this is to show that we're making progress and that um, that industry is serious about this. And as we adopt more uh, broadband links to aircraft that are safety services, we're going to have a protocol that can that can ride on it. So, um, in summary, um, the, the things that we'd like you to remember is first of all that we have a 
ACARS and an ATN network that we've invested in, that its purpose is for operational and safety critical communication. Um, you benefit from a private and protected network. But ACARS use has been growing and, and most of that growth has been non-safety aircraft and engine data. And that's been most of the growth. And we've got to figure out a way to preserve the capacity by removing this data uh, from VHF and um, save safety and operationally critical information for VHF. And then also consider modernizing our VHF for the, for the medium term so that it, 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 it remains uh, a reliable and can, can continue to perform for CPVLC and operationally critical, but while also really supporting the future technologies like um, the internet uh, protocol suite so that once we have uh, viable um, uh, um, critical masses of IP enabled safety service aircraft, we can, we can move forward uh, to IP comms. So with that, um, I want to thank you for listening, uh, listening to us and hope that we provided some information for you to consider and to think about. Um, and at this point, uh, we'll be happy to uh, answer any questions that, that, you, that you may have um, and um, look forward to, uh, to that. All right, I am bringing up the questions. Will this presentation be made available to participants? Uh, the yes, it will in PDF forms. Um, would ACARS over IP be used below 10,000 feet altitude? Uh, so while an aircraft is flying, um, so that would be a, a function of uh, how uh, the connectivity is implemented on an aircraft. If uh, an aircraft is connected uh, to, uh, to VDL, um, of course it would be, it would be communicating uh, on VHF. If for some reason it has an IP link to a SATCOM, and it is still it is still connected to that SATCOM link, and that SATCOM link is enabled below 10,000 feet, and um, and and uplinking the ACARS over IP, um, it it could send the information, especially if you're talking about aircraft and engine engine data. Uh, once the aircraft is on the ground, um, as today, um, ACARS over IP has been and can be used over cellular. Question is: Is advanced VHF standardized? RTCA, uh, AirRank, and EuroK. Uh, the 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 answer to that is um, not at this point. We want it to be standardized. Uh, we are uh, bringing it forward to industry. We have a paper that we sent to ICAO. We would like um, industry to um, to uh, show an interest so that we can move forward with standardization so we can get all the stakeholders together and discuss this and come forward with uh, the standards that are needed so that it can be implemented in a manner that is common and acceptable for um, use by uh, all the stakeholders, uh, by uh, the users and by the various stakeholders in the aircraft and, and, and for the service providers. Okay, next question. Does IPS introduce more overhead in communication, thus reducing, just reducing the available bandwidth? Um, that is a technical question that I cannot answer, and that if you, if we, if we take it down, or we, uh, or you send it in an email to us, we could answer it. Or if there's an engineer. Um, on the call from Collins that uh, is, uh, can answer that, then we can address it right now.
The aircraft systems and engine data is this one way messages reporting can be sent from the aircraft to the ground also two way pinging the aircraft temperature of a bearing. Okay, so um, what I've what I've been uh, talking about today is uh, the way that VHF and for that matter could be narrow band SATCOM is being used by aircraft to send uh, aircraft health and engine data while the aircraft is flying. And today uh, that is a one-way downlink. That's a downlink from the aircraft to, to the ground. Uh, could be sent to the airline, could be sent to engine, engine manufacturers. Uh, Two-way ground systems pinging the aircraft to, to check on specific data. Um, that would be a capability um, that um, would be introduced in more genera next generation aircraft over a IP link. Um, and um, I think that we would see emerging over, over the next, uh, over the coming decades um, as IP becomes more prevalent and um, and the capabilities to kind of integrate the aircraft to get this data to to the ground or to send information from the ground to the aircraft uh, will be implemented. Yeah, Dan, this is uh, Andrew Ankin. I'm also oh, with yeah. Collins. Yeah, thank you, Andrew. Yeah, um, just a little bit to add to that, right? So today, as as Dan talked about, you know, aircraft and engine information are downlink only. But as you know, as capacity is added and, and new capabilities are added to aircraft, these new types of applications that are being asked about are certainly possible. But those are driven by the, you know, in the engine case, by the engine manufacturers, right? Not by the network provider. So it's, it's kind of a question for the the engine manufacturers. Thank you, Andrew. A Andrew, do you have a uh, do you have any insight into the overhead on IPS? Yeah. Well, so. I believe right now, so so IPS is being standardized um, through uh, AWC and RTCA, ISO, uh, ISO, um, um, Eurokai, uh, and they are aiming to make it more efficient than today's OSI standards. But right, we're still we're still in standardization process, and uh, right, so that's the goal. So we'll see we'll see what comes out of it. It should be at least as efficient as uh, OSI is today. Thanks, Andrew. There's a question here on uh, in the US if there's a roadmap regarding the, de the development and deployment of LDAX. And um, to the best of my knowledge, unless someone knows, knows uh, better than me, I don't believe LDAX is on a roadmap uh, for development and deployment uh, in the U.S. at this point. Right, and when we've been tracking LDAX, it appears that in the U.S. there's some uh, frequency spectrum issues um, regarding military systems that uh, may be hard to overcome with the spectrum that they're talking about using. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, due to the situation in the aviation world, is there setbacks to IPS? Um, I would I would say um, that's a very good that's a good question. I would say that no, uh, we we in industry um, are continuing to move forward uh, with IPS aggressively. Uh, this is a long term initiative. And long term, we mean you know eight to ten years. Uh, and we um, um, in Collins, we're continuing and we we will continue to invest in IPS. We think it's very important. And uh, anything that's happening in the near term. Um, we don't we don't really see any impact at all and 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 kind of related to that question um is uh hey you know you talked a lot about volume of of data what what happens now um that um when aircraft are you know many aircraft are retired and uh airlines are will be operating fewer aircraft especially in the near term um so the answer to that is is we've looked at that uh pretty extensively over the past couple months and what we're what, what we're projecting um, is that sure a lot of aircraft are going to be retired uh, fleets are going to be reduced at least initially for the next few years but airlines are going to be uh, depending on these newer generation aircraft these more more fuel efficient uh, better performing aircraft um, 
in the near term and in the future now more than ever. So uh, we're, we're, we might see, um, what will happen is we might see those, remember those pie charts actually shift quicker where the percentage of, of newer generation aircraft increase a lot quicker than what we thought um, when those charts were originally developed. And because of that, um, the data that these airplanes produce. So, you know, every, for every one, every one uh, legacy aircraft that is retired, a new generation aircraft delivers four times or four of those aircraft equivalents. So we see that, that trend continuing. Question: How long will in, will the industry have to wait to reduce the pain on sending engine data? What are the inter, what's the intermediate low cost solution? Well, um, the good news here is um, there is a cars over IP. It's been implemented by service providers. That um, there are uh, people are start or airlines are starting to use it. What we need to do as industry is use it in a way because we have all the tools to, to, to make this pain go away. Use it in a way to, to attack the pain. And by that, we mean is implement systems on the airplane that will discriminate between these large, large data that is coming from aircraft engines that is not safety critical. Uh, and again, I'm not talking about engine exceedance. I'm talking about engine reports and aircraft reports and directing that to IP. So if we, we've, we've, we've developed ACARS over IP, we've implemented it on the ground. Uh, Bo, uh, um, Airbus through FOMAX has implemented ACARS over IP in their FOMAX NEO aircraft. And there's a, a cabin SATCOM option. So ideally, um, if you are an airline that has cabin SATCOM, has accepted ACARS over IP and has FOMAX, uh, while you're en route, you can you can select engine information and send it over your cabin cabin IP link and send your uh, your operationally critical information over over VDL or or, or safety services that come. Um, let's see. Next question. Uh, will advanced capacity for, okay, will advanced VH provide sufficient capacity for advanced cop sets like 4D trajectory management will come along with much more data exchange? And um, Andrew, I might need your help with this. Um, I would say that we are, we are kind of working on that right now in terms of internally trying to prove out the additional capacity. We believe it's around three times per BDL frequency. Um, but I'm unaware of uh, the amount of data that is going to be um, going to be moved uh, over 4D trajectory management. So that yeah. can be either an action item or or uh, we can try to answer it right now. So what we're finding, right, and I think what Dan is, has been explaining through this presentation is that the the vast amount of growth in communications um, demand is from these aircraft and engine information applications. So what we see is that while there is growth in air traffic services communication demand, and we, intend, and we, we see that that growth will continue, it's, it's to some extent dwarfed by the growth in aircraft and engine information, which is really why we focused on that through this presentation. If we can solve that problem and add the capacity that we're talking, to, talking about adding, we believe that we can extend the life of data communications um, for, for quite a while, right, to, to support these new types of applications such as 4D trajectory management. Yeah. Excellent as, point, and, Andrew, that is, um, and that's a, that's, that is key. Thank you for bringing that up. So what we want to do is collectively remove, remove the volume uh, that is non-safety critical, um, modernize the network, and to Andrew's point, if we're able to do that, uh, then we have a tremendous amount of capacity through the existing system, and we should be able to continue to add um, safety service uh, new capabilities, such for 4D trajectory, to uh, to offset that. So, thank you, Andrew. That's an excellent point. In fact, 
Uh, I think we're kind of getting close to time. We're uh, close to the top of the hour, so um, it, um, we're going to have to end our our time with you. We're 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 respectful of your time, um, and um, I, I just want to thank everyone. Great questions. Again, um, hope that all of you um, uh, had some takeaways for this. Uh, we look forward to seeing everyone in industry and future discussions and uh, on these topics. And uh, we're excited about the future. And uh, everyone uh, have a have a great rest of your day and uh, stay safe out there. Uh, take care. Goodbye.